Okay, we'll, okay, we'll start off. So that's a seven-year-old boy with complaints of two episodes of vomiting over the last two months. There was a past history of metabolic decompensation at the age of two years. Presently, the child has no neurological issues. At the time of the scan, we had a proven diagnosis, but the imaging findings were slightly atypical for the um, clinical for the for the diagnosis. So this is the scan at the age of seven years, and as previously described, there are multiple prominent cystic spaces, predominantly in the frontal regions on both sides, pericalosal regions also involving the deep and periventricular white matter. No abnormalities in the basal ganglia. The brainstem demonstrates these hyperintense changes also in the dentate nuclei. On the flare images, you can appreciate the CSS suppression. And again, on the coronal images, these prominent perivascular spaces in the subcortical, periventricular, and deep white matter. Corpus callosum is slightly dysplastic. Posterior fossa structures demonstrate normal volume. No abnormalities on the diffusion weighted sequences corresponding to the hyperintense changes in the brainstem and the cerebellar white matter. So this is actually a case of maple serum urine disease. So this was a recent uh, random mass spectroscopy and you can appreciate that as compared to the healthy control, there are elevated levels of branch chain amino acids. The only peculiar finding or slightly atypical finding I found in this case was the predominant uh, pattern of perivascular, prominent perivascular spaces. This is an example from the Vandenab book. It's a single case, I think this was contributed from India. Again, you have these prominent perivascular spaces with the typical features of maple syrup urine disease. Here is a two case series where they found these, these again prominent perivascular spaces and some spinal cord hyperintensities in the late onset maple syrup urine disease. The common conditions with perivascular spaces, which we all know, are these hypomyelocytop, P10, malformation mutations, low syndromes, manosidosis, MPS. So the question is, if anyone has seen these uh, imaging patterns of peri prominent perivascular spaces with cases of MSUD. If I may just ask you, Nihal, in terms of the pathogenesis yeah. of maple syrup urine disease, is there any storage involved in this process? Do you mean, uh, um, I'm not sure, I'm just, I just think that it's a deficiency of the branch chain amino acids. You're asking yeah. if, it's, if, it, if it has so, a storage disorder associated yeah. with it? Yeah, generally when we see perivascular spaces, a few yeah. thoughts arise are whether it's a storage kind of disorder or yeah. whether there is a clearance problem of waste from the brain, which mm. essentially means that the lymphatic system, which we are still trying to yeah. understand, might be activated in some way. So I think these yeah. two factors need to be considered here. The signal abnormality in the brainstem and the uh, cerebellar regions is quite typical, but the perivascular yeah. space is not, isn't it? Yeah. So can I make a comment? Yeah, 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 Dr. Okay. So Shitis, that will be very odd to, in a small molecular disorder, to think of a storage disorder. So there's two different entities, isn't it? So maple syrup urine. So when you think of amino acidopathies, organic acidurias, you think of a excitotoxin brain damage, small molecular disorder leading to diffusion restriction and changes. While in a storage disorder, you have deposition. So you have perivascular spaces prominent, thalamic hyperdensity. So completely two different conditions. So it's very unusual to explain, to use that as an explanation for these perivascular spaces prominence. Because they're two different, you know, we are on the two different streams completely. Yeah. So from the perivascular spaces point of view, just the pathology aside, I think this is how radiologists would think. Is this a storage problem or is this a clearance problem? So in MSUD, we can't explain the storage issue, but is this a clearance? Is it interrupting CSF clearance? Is it toxic to the brain environment in that way? And the other question is whether perivascular space uh, as a presentation is typical in more older children, because we, of course we don't see it in the younger ones, right? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, if there are no further comments, 
not really. I think it's probably the clearer. Dr. Nehal, can you show the slide yeah. with the differentials for these uh, spaces? I mean, are they all storage disorders? Not all of them. No, um, it's storage or clearance issues, basically. Clearance issues. So, manosidosis is one. Um, you have MPS. But, yeah. Maybe some other mechanisms as well for these uh, findings. Mm. Absolutely, I think we are. We don't know much about perivascular spaces. Yeah, and sometimes they can be giant and tumor factor as well. But you've got another slide on perivascular spaces there, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so probably a clearance issue, but not very certain of the uh, pattern mechanism. Does Vandernapp's book explain anything in that respect, or as no? It's just it just that's a it just lists out a case of. So I think it was from Gangaram Hospital. I'm not sure of the, uh, who had sent it, but it's it was from India. And considering it's a two thousand, the edition is in two thousand five. I'm not sure if. The lymphatics were um, in prominence. No, so in fact, even, even till date, we don't know much about the lymphatic yeah. system and the lymphatic clearance of the brain. But I'm sure yeah. these things are toxic to the brain environment in its own way, right? Yeah. Okay. No further comments. We'll move on to our next case. Case two is from Dr. Vivek. Dr. Vivek, do you want to yeah. go ahead with the clinical presentation? Yeah. Yeah, so 11 month old child, uh, male child, who two weeks back had uh, acute gastroenteritis and within two days had rapid placid quadriparesis and got ventilated in a day with no hypoxic events, no, no hypotensive events. And the child. Uh, uh, his NCV showed uh, acute motor sensory neuropathy with no conduction, no amplitudes present. So he was a bad GBS. So as part of a protocol, we did uh, CSF, CSF studies, which showed very high protein with normal cells. And uh, we did the contrast spine. And we did the brain as well. We often do it just because we are doing the study once. So. So the contrast study showed typical features, uh, LS spine of, uh, uh, of GBS, and uh, it was more the brain MRI. There were some subtle changes which I hadn't seen in GBS before, which I wanted to discuss. And the child hadn't had any hypoxia or hypotension. Okay. Does it clinically fit Miller Fisher, Dr. Vivek? By any chance? No, I no. don't think that. Yeah. There's so, no ophthalmopathy, there's no way. So yeah, there's no ophthalmoplegia, no uh, facial palsy. The child's facial expression is really good. It's everything from arms below. Okay. So this is the spine uh, MRI, which is pretty characteristic for a acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy or a GBS. You have the thickening and enhancement of the cardiac nerve roots. The ventral and dorsal nerve roots are thickened. But coming to the brain MRI, on the diffusion weighted sequences on top, you can appreciate that the anterior and the fornix, and also areas of the mesotemporal lobes uh, demonstrate restricted diffusion. The optic pathways, that is the proximal optic pathways and the chasm also demonstrates restricted diffusion. There was a mention of uh, cortical restricted diffusion in the cortex, but I cannot appreciate um, them at least on the images which are provided. So the only question was um, involvement of the op these optic nerves mesotemporal lobes, the fornix associated with the uh, GBS uh, spectrum. So I think all, this is, was the investigative, uh, what we found was acute motor sensory axillary neuropathy with increased CSF proteins and cells. So it falls into the MSN variant of uh, GBS. Um, just a approach for the spinal nerve root enhancement, I think we can clearly point out that the changes are uh, reflective of William Barry syndrome, differentials for the peripheral nerve, spinal nerve root enhancement are listed below. But I think clinically and illogically, 
um, it fits into a GBS uh, spectrum. There are some uh, papers out there which have uh, demonstrated multiple cranial nerve root enhancement in bullen barry syndrome, as you can see in this paper, the fifth nerve, the twelfth nerve, the eleventh nerve, and also the facial nerves uh, demonstrate uh, the, the enhancement. And I found this case series where they uh, found optic pathway involvement, but that was in patients with Miller Fisher syndrome. As you can see, the optic nerves and the chiasm demonstrate uh, enhancement along with the cranial nerve enhancement, along with the cord equine nerve root enhancement. So I'm not able to explain the uh, changes in the phonics and the temporal lobes if it's part of an autoimmune. Uh, uh, is related to autoimmune or some form of demyelination. I'm not sure of that. So if it was autoimmune or demyelination, you know, restricted diffusion shouldn't have been there. So that shows that it's a cytotoxic event, you know. So that's mm -hmm. odd. That's a bit odd for... <clears throat> so, and and the, and the ones you showed, there was optic nerve enhancement. Yeah. And this yeah, is not enhancement, this is diffusion restriction. This is diffusion restriction. But I don't think contrast was given for the patient. Uh, not for the brain, no. Yeah, not for so, the brain. So, so diffusion restriction is odd for an inflammatory disorder. That's something. Uh, the something else just wanted to mention something interesting. Yeah. Probably people know. Uh, so when we did the whole spine, we also did nerve root and we looked at the nerve root enhancement in the cervical region. And what we found was cervical nerve roots were enhanced, but the maximum enhancement was in the lumbosacral region. So it's just a learning that whenever one does it, even if there is quadriparesis, one has to look at this lumbosacral area. That's what we learned. Okay. Did the child have any subclinical seizures? Never had seizures. So he was with us within two days. Uh, you know, uh, so he progressed in front of us in the ICU. And the CSF was clear. Yeah, just five cells. Apart from, and... proteins, apart from proteins. No bands. We haven't done bands as for oligoclonal bands. Yes. Because I have a question for the neurologists in the audience. When we say GBS, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a syndromic diagnosis, but when we pick up quadriquina enhancement without the context of exactly what's happening clinically, we start thinking inflammatory infective causes. And for us uh, to call something GBS needs to have the clinical involvement in terms of the ascending paralysis, etc. But then uh, radiologically, we can't really distinguish between AIDP and the polyneuropathy syndrome from GBS quite easily. And this paper, which is a very good paper by Thierry Hussman et al., I don't know whether they looked into dorsal ventral predominant involvement of the cauda equina nerve roots. Uh, Nihal, you might correct me, I have not read this paper recently, and whether that has any bearing. Because in your case, you had very symmetric and quite extensive involvement of both dorsal and ventral roots. I think they have, but they mentioned that uh, both possibilities are can be present, ventral, dorsal, and both mixed pattern. Uh, something else which we probably people again know so often sometimes what happens you have uh, polio like illness acute onset uh, West Nile fever which causes more of a asymmetric paraparesis or quadriparesis what there what we found anterior horn cell you know the anterior horn area is significantly enhanced but the nerve roots are not so that also helps the LS spine contrast study to look if it is GBS or if it is a polio-like illness. So that way also it helps. Because in polio-like illnesses, you will have more of a anterior horn cell contrast yeah. enhancement. Yeah. Okay. It, it's more the diffusion restriction because, you know, it's just an inflammatory condition. So diffusion restriction is odd. That's the thing. What is, what is the etiology of GBS? So, uh, what uh, people think that, uh, so for example, a bacteria or a virus, when it occurs, so the 
body gets confused that in the myelin, the antigen or the epitome of the bacteria or virus is sitting and attacks, you know, the autoimmune disorder. That's what we understand. And that causes in significant inflammation leading to uh, the condition. So it is still a post-infectious or para-infectious phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. And that would explain the brain findings here in terms of these other changes as well. Do you agree with that, Nihal? Because for yeah. us, for DCL change, uh, you know, it's actually non-specific. It's like the splenial uh, signal change that can be transient. Yeah. We think about infections, para-infectious phenomenon. So maybe there is an infectious, big infectious driver in this case, which is leading to these changes. So it won't be unusual, given that GBS is a post-infective phenomenon, right, by and large. Okay, that might be one of the explanations that this insult could be the infectious process and then later the GBS happened. I think so. The only thing is it's not at all cortical, it's just the chiasma, so that's all. <clears throat> Dr. Yeah, Vivek, what was your vision? I mean, this child? So norm, normal vision, normal pupillary constriction, normal focus. Okay. Okay. Hmm. okay, so probably para infectious cause is a possible hypothesis for the causes of the brain changes associated with uh, TBS as of now. I think so. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Next case again from Dr. Vivek. Dr. Vivek, you can go so, ahead. Yeah, so this uh, so it's a diagnostic dilemma as a child, as well as the MRI findings I wanted to discuss. So this baby uh, antenatally had a small head. But after birth, she was performing well, like at 11 months. If you will see the videos at 11 months, the first video shows that she's performing like an eight, nine month old baby, except for a, a small head for her age, which also, if you look at the baby, doesn't look that small. Um, at that time, which was last year, May, when she was around 11 months, she had an acute febrile illness in which she deteriorated, got admitted in the local hospital and was admitted there for six weeks. Now the problem is the six weeks uh, course is not very clear, but in summary, she had frequent left focal seizures, which somehow got uh, controlled with uh, three anti-epileptics. Uh, and then she also had pericardial effusion twice, which was tapped. And uh, a month later, she came to me in the OPD after this illness. So six weeks she was in the uh, hospital at 11 months. She came to me after a month. At the time, she was on multiple anti-epileptics and she had regressed. Uh, she had uh, she now started to have a movement disorder where she will have episodes of oculogyria. Uh, again, there is a video, uh, dyskinesia, dystonia, and uh, breakthrough seizures, which will occur mostly from left, sometimes from the right. Uh, so a baby who was having antenatal small head, who till 11th was performing like a eight, nine month old baby after acute illness, regressed, and then it started to have seizures, movement disorder. So she's still admitted with us. She again got admitted with us a few weeks back. Now she's 18 month age. This all started in May last year at 11 month age. In between, I've been trying to change the antiepileptics and seizures will be controlled for a few days and then restart. Uh, this time she got admitted. She This time she got admitted with uh, frequent seizures, but the seizures are controlled, but the movement disorder persists. So over the last uh, six months, I have uh, evaluated her. So she already had an MRI. First MRI was at six months and the second MRI was done at 15 months and there was significant cortical atrophy now. Um, that one I wanted to discuss. Um, she has had normal CSF glucose, she, lactate, uh, metabolic profile in the blood is normal. She has just, I have just sent her CSF neurotransmitters to Dr. Jalan. Uh, I've done a whole exome trio, which is normal. I've just had an approval from uh, Manju Kurian, so I'm sending her whole genome sequencing to her as part of a movement disorder project. 
and just yesterday suddenly i thought can she have nmda so i sent her she has nmda because i never thought of that because she always had a small head and but if she had come to me for the first time nmda i should have thought of so that also i have sent and she had this anti pr3 positive uh, antibody which is seen in uh, c anka but uh, we didn't give much because she's too small and her rest of the workup was normal she also had a small mild positivity of ana but one one considers her as a whole it looks more like a genetic disorder but uh, yesterday then i thought maybe i should rule out a autoimmune like an mdba as well but that result is still awaiting okay so congenital microcephaly with seizures i won't say microcephaly okay. small head okay anterior small, small head two standard deviation okay, okay. in fact her uh, mri first one was done around 6 7 month age so even before this deterioration so the local pediatrician must have thought that she did have some delay which needed evaluation with the mri okay vivek do you think it's uh, the right age for nmda though so uh, yeah so the my young, so my youngest patient was 4 month old so that's still the youngest in the world that so is i think quite young yeah thanks for letting us yeah. know that yeah probably again triggered by an initial viral insult or something right in that case. so it's just what i have thought just yesterday but i have been sort of struggling with her for last now 7 months and uh, so i don't know whether that's the right thought but there's so many so much going on with her so all right we now look at the mr images So you say this is at seven months, Doctor. Yeah, this is seven months. months. This is not eleven months. Okay. It's seven months. Okay. So it's seven months. Um, these are selected images from the external films. Uh, you can appreciate that there is reduced volume in the supratendinal brain parenchyma, but uh, what I also see is there is simplified gyration in the bilateral frontal and the temporal lobes. Um, the basal ganglia and thalamus are not very clear. The images are grainy, but the simplified gyration and the volume loss is uh, visible the corpus callosum is also hypogenetic or hypoplastic the posterior fossa structures are relatively normal you can also see that there is some slanting of the uh, frontal region which uh, can be seen in patients with children with small head or microcephaly moving on to the follow up scan we have better resolution images and again there is some degree of volume loss but again i can appreciate that there is simplified gyration pattern Uh, extends i mean bilaterally involving the cerebral hemispheres on both sides again the corpus callosum is abnormal the posterior fossa structures are relatively normal in the coronal images again you can appreciate the gyration abnormalities it is simplified no calcification or hemorrhage on the gradient echo sequences so based on that i thought a possibility of uh, simplified gyration with a small head um, should be evaluated they usually tend to have seizures white matter volume loss can be also be seen corpus callosum abnormalities can also be seen the posterior fossa structures can be small or normal so i would uh, put it down to microcephaly or small head with uh, simplified gar- extensive simplified gyration pattern and volume loss um, as a diagnosis and probably look for genetic disorders i'm not sure how the uh, autoimmune panel fits into the uh, imaging Um, features here and so ought to have pericardial effusion twice so she had it at 11 mm-hmm. months and then again at 14 months and that had to be tabbed each time okay. and no hypoproteinemia is there an so element you want to comment is there an element of neurodegeneration happening as well between 7 months and 15 months I completely yeah. agree with your simplified gyral pattern theory, but there's also, first of all, there is an active neuronal loss, I think, going on as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the degeneration is supratentorial. Not that we will be able to make yeah. it more specific in terms of where we are headed to, but I think once we have the answer, we can look back and try to understand the pathology a bit better. Uh, I think I, the corpus, corpus callosum was a bit dysmorphic right from the start, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. what what troubles me is you know when we have patients with simplified gyral pattern with seizure her seizures are not that frequent that should cause so much regression mm-hmm. 
so what troubles me is the significant regression and the atrophy which has happened over the last seven months so that makes you wonder if there is a secondary process going on as well how are you planning to work it up with it so so we have done so as much i could work up i have done so uh, so csf neurotransmitters are awaited because of the movement disorder whole exome sequencing is normal so i have just sent a whole genome to your center yeah i'm sure uh, dr vivek uh, have you done any uh, like uh, immune work immune uh, uh, kind of pathology work up immunodeficiency like antibodies and oh. all those things but it is a type of some congenital immunodeficiency because they can present as autoimmune kind of disorders very early in life because of dysregulation so of yeah so cvid can present common variable immunodeficiency can present with autoimmune disorders so we did a immunoglobulin profile which was normal actually our igg was slightly raised so we did a in fact we had done a ana which was positive in low titers and then we did the anca workup and this came up pr3 so tpo was negative and i've done a csf and md and what is the so cbc like are the eosinophils high so, or anything like that no like eosinophils are not high lymphocytes are normal neutrophilia was there initially because of infection so because in immuno deficiency it's to be like a, some disorder of uh, yeah Disorders. Yeah, immune dysregulation. Yeah, mostly immune dysregulation. So, yeah, it's just uh, because here anti because of the simplified viral pattern, antenatal small head. So you just wonder what you are dealing with. Are you dealing with just uh, uh, that disorder, or there are two disorders going on because of the regression and because of this atrophy? and the appearance of movement yeah. disorder which was not there because with simplified diarrheal pattern if the seizures are there maybe once or twice a month you won't get a significant movement disorder in form of ocular gyria dyskinesia if we take a step back from the simplified gyral pattern uh, if you go back to the initial scan nihal uh, first of all we have an overall reduced volume of the brain anyways in the cerebral hemispheres actually there is some gyrification it could be coarse uh, it may not be simplified but they seem to lose that over time as well so it's actually the primary flavor here is that of neurodegeneration that's happening which is involving both the gray and white matter so if you put that third picture in your memory and just move to the next one uh, you would see that there is an active change in terms of so they have they've almost lost their gyral folds over time but i think that's to do with the Uh, polio dystrophy or the atrophy that is globally happening. Of course, at this time, even the cerebellar dentates, I don't think, are completely normal. Though the cerebellar volume is preserved. So a bit of open mind about looking at primary simplified gyral patterns, of which there are certain genes, uh, but this seems to be a very active neurodegenerative process. would you agree nihal yeah sure thanks that's useful okay thank you case 4 um, was recently seen by dr nikit um, this is a one year child with recurrent encephalopathy global delay failed to thrive and microcephaly and was microcephalic the child was initially scanned in september 21 and i think the child came back for a follow up dr nikit do you want to give us the rest of the details of the case uh, initially uh, this child presented back in september last year uh, approximately age was 11 months one year that time uh, presented with fever followed by encephalopathy uh, but also uh, had some developmental issues that time A significant failure to thrive and microcephaly, uh, and then the scans would show up. Uh, then she presented again, uh, consanguineous family. She presented again in February, uh, just few days back in the beginning of February, with another episode of encephalopathy. In the, uh, the first episode, because it was a febrile uh, fever followed by encephalopathy, we did CSF and other things, which were completely normal. 
uh, we couldn't identify any organism on that. Uh, then second episode, of, and that time we had few differentials in mind uh, because there was calcifications on the CT scan and the MRI, which uh, Nihal, you would show up in a, a bit. Uh, uh, with those differentials, uh, that time we were thinking about the post-infectious process, I mean, the infectious process causing all these changes on a background of uh, uh, some existing problem. Uh, then she presented with another episode of encephalopathy and uh, rapid improvement in sensorium uh, following a thiamine injection. I mean, we just uh, we didn't actually think about thiamine, but uh, we just thought because uh, there is a basal ganglia involvement and all those sort of things, uh, which is bilaterally symmetrical. Let's uh, try and give a thiamine injection and the sensorium improved very rapidly, uh, in less than 48 hours, back to normal self. Uh, she was deeply comatose and then she went home walking. So this is what is the presentation. Uh, quite a bit odd points radiologically various uh, things. Uh, the primary suspected uh, diagnosis based on the initial scans for uh, cardiovascular syndrome uh, because of presence of uh, calcifications in basal ganglia region. Okay. Um, I don't have the CT images, but these are the MR images uh, from September. And you can see they are symmetrical but punctate foci involving the bilateral basal ganglia, predominantly the dorsal striatum, and the central median thalamic nuclei, the temporal, the mesial temporal lobes, and also some areas of the basal frontal region. They show reversal on the ADC sequences. T2, you can appreciate that there is some degree of volume loss, some periventricular hyperintensities. The ventricles are slightly prominent and with reduced white matter volume. The corpus callosum is also thinned out. Flare again, we have these periventricular hyperintensities with reduced volume, some areas of gliosis going on there. And these punctate foci in the bilateral basal ganglia and uh, thalamus, also involving the pons. On the SWI images, I could not appreciate any foci of abnormality and uh, post. Uh, contrast there was no uh, there was no significant degree of enhancement though the foci are punctate uh, slightly non confluent but they demonstrate some area of symmetry but symmetry can be uh, misleading sometimes based on that and the, then we did a spectroscopy uh, not very specific or diagnostic so based on the if you focus on the symmetry and the dorsal striatal and the periaqueductal region involvement Diet and thiamine uh, could be a possibility, less likely for a lay or other differentials of uh, basal ganglia. I was not aware of the calcification on CT, but uh, I'm not sure if Icardi glutarase presents like that. Dr. Mankar has recently published a review paper on it. So I'll ha hand it over to Dr. Mankar for further comments. Do we have the CT scan? No, I don't. I mean, uh, I don't have the CT scan. The calcification is not confirmed, right? No, no, no. So there Dr. is Nikhil? clear calcification, punctate oh. calcification, bilaterally symmetrical. Somebody has seen the CT scan. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, EGS um, would have more dense calcification uh, rather than small punctates, but it's still worth excluding if we are clutching at straws and not knowing what we're doing here. Mm. Uh, so we have sent genetics for this child uh, for whatever I think we probably wanted to repeat another scan as well but uh, because of financial constraints we thought we'll invest that money uh, in doing genetics so and that would give us a definitive answer as well so we have sent it for uh, I mean the suspicious things are timing transporter uh, deficiency versus acardiopathy syndrome but yeah, a lot of odd points for whatever. I mean, timing, it is not a very typical where what we see confluent yeah. type of uh, changes. Yeah. I have a question for you, Nikit. Uh, you must have treated it as presumed biotin responsive, right? So did they respond? Yeah, to yeah, presumed. Because they we had done whatever metabolic workup we had done, everything turned out to be negative. Uh, so this is only out of. I mean, this this wasn't primary suspicion, but uh, we thought based on the symmetrical lesions and uh, yeah. areas of involvement, whether worth whatever worth, it's like a simple thing. What we can do, not going to harm. Uh, so that is why we tried uh, giving intravenous thiamine. 
because uh, in a way you might if you look at the adc maps on the top uh, last two pictures it's actually quite confluent those changes even if it doesn't show on the other sequences isn't it uh, nihal yeah. you can see yeah. the values are quite confluent so it, it might very well be um, bad in time in responsive disease this you know Okay. Do we see the white matter changes? So uh, yes, you can have a lot of white matter changes in them. Um, in, yeah. in fact, in, even involving the subcortical white matter, the brainstem, the cerebellar vermis. Uh, this is just based on the clusters that we have seen. Where I, I don't know whether we've seen the full extent of this particular disorder. Uh, I just wanted to make sure, also from the kid, whether there were any skin manifestations at all, which would help. Uh, not really. I mean, nothing. Uh, no chill planes or any of those uh, AGS sort of manifestations. Okay. Uh, but yeah, nothing in the skin. And no blush cores or any other large areas of skin involvement. No, no, no absolutely not. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's a question of waiting for those results, but I think you have probably yeah. treated this person. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably. I mean, we are just waiting because uh, not sure. The initial thought was uh, small vessel involvement and AGS, those sort of uh, congenital vasculopathies uh, type of thing. The uh, AGS side of thing, if you had a CSF sample, you could have, I don't know how easy it is to run an interferon signature on that, um, whether you had any from, because it is at the end of the day an interferonopathy, but I don't know how yeah, accessible yeah. the test is. Uh, I'm not pretty sure. Maybe seniors in the group can answer, but as far as I'm aware, uh, it is going to be challenging uh, to do it. So, so you can do Terence. Terence will be raised. So that you can do with Dr. Jalan. Uh, okay, Dr. I mean, we, can, we can try doing that, but uh, major financial constraints here. Uh, so I think out so of easier whatever to do the genetics. Yeah, we have already sent uh, the whole exome uh, and we are just waiting. I think this is only a couple of weeks back. So uh, we are just waiting for that. Uh, and probably once we get the genetics, probably it will be worth yeah. uh, updating in the sure. forum and uh, yeah, sure. we'll do that. Okay. Sure. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Case five from Dr. Romit. I don't think we have Dr. Romit. He has an emergency call. Uh, but anyway, anyway, just go through the case. Presently, it's a six year boy with global development of and refractory epilepsy. The birth history the child is a full term child, cried immediately after birth, and was admitted for early septicemia in the ICU for seven days. The anterior ultrasound are demonstrated microcephaly and ventriculomegaly. On examination now, the child is microcephalic, has polyplegic spasticity with pseudovulvar dysfunction. His question was, uh, is this a genetic disorder or a, a congenital torch type infective uh, pathology? Unfortunately, these are the only films which we have. We don't have a sagittal or, an, or a coronal. And we also don't have a ACT or a um, gradient decor or SWS sequence. But what is visible is uh, the, it is a microcephalic brain with uh, malformed, it's a malformed brain. There is some area of bottom malformation, probably polymicrogyria. The subcortical areas demonstrate T2 hypo intensities. I don't know if these are uh, calcific areas or not. There is a significant ventricomegaly, periventricular and subcortical white matter changes. This scan is at four months. The basic ganglia also is slightly abnormal, dysmorphic, but that is probably owing to the uh, appearance of the lateral ventricles. Posterior fossa wise, I could not appreciate any dysplasia uh, on the limited film images. And um, yeah, we do not have a sagittal or a coronal, coronal to evaluate the corpus callosum or the uh, brainstem. Um, so overall, um, I think polymicrogyric brain with ventricomegaly, some white matter changes, um, possible dysmorphic basic ganglia. So on imaging wise, these are the uh, major findings. If anyone wants to add anything and given the lack of CT or other sequences, I'm not able to point it down to a definite cause, but probably given probably a genetic cause would be a, a primary differential or a pseudo torch if this is in fact uh, subcortical calcification such as OCLN mutation. 
Is Sanjay to yeah. CMV should be ruled out or not? I'm not sure of that. Probably should be ruled out given the white matter yeah. changes as well, isn't it? I, I completely agree yeah. that this could be calcification and then you're looking at occludens. But I think given the, yeah. the little bit of white matter that is left has got high signal in it. So yeah. we should start with torch exclusion as much as possible. But at six years, I think that's the challenge to find out if it's a congenital torch or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, what I have found that. useful, what I found useful is to do a BERA. So if BERA shows uh, uh, reduced, uh, you know, the, if the hearing is uh, affected on BERA, uh, CMV will always cause that. So either you just have hearing involvement, and if it is more severe, hearing involvement will be there. So even though we don't, we cannot do uh, a, a CMV testing because ideally it should be done on a Guthrie card at this age. But BERA can help sometimes. Okay. That's a very good suggestion, actually. Yeah. I, I don't know, because you do look at the dysmorphic basal ganglia and you start thinking about yeah. tubulins as well, but the yeah. calcification, if it is true, calcification is unusual, I think, for tubulins, though the polymicrogyria would be fairly consistent with a tubulin-activated protein problem. But I think uh, common things being common, we should start with acquired things as best as possible before a lot of money is spent trying to test all these various genes. Any other siblings affected in the family? Uh, unfortunately, he's not here, so that's the, this is the only clinical details I have. I can check with him. That will make it more relevant, but if no one else is affected, then it probably is acquired, yeah. right? Yeah. If you can run a CT scan, that will be useful. It will be uh, easy and yeah. super. Yeah. Hello. All right. Thank you. Case six is from Dr. Ramya. Is Ramya here? Okay. I don't think she's here, but I'll just run through the case. So this child is a one year male child with developmental delay and presented with seizures at the age of eight months and nine months followed by a developmental regression. The child was admitted for vomitings and an MRI was done. On the top panel, we have the diffusion weighted sequences where you can appreciate symmetrical areas of abnormalities in the mid and, dos mid and posterior pitamen, the brainstem involving the cerebral peduncles and the dorsal brainstem, also extending inferiorly into the medulla and also the cervical cord. Corresponding changes on the T2-weighted sequences. And if you see the spot abnormalities extend up to the upper cervical cord, at least on the visible images. The question was, um, does it fit into a mitochondrial disorder? Uh, I would probably think that should be the number one, I mean, at least the eye on the priority list for a mitochondrial disorder. Uh, probably a tRNA-related uh, disorder or the R-related mutations given the uh, spinal cord involvement to be evaluated, but um, overall, I think it changes fit into a mitochondrial disorder. And if there, if there are any other differentials, I'm not sure if they fit in, but I'm thinking of mitochondrial with probably tRNA related uh, mutations. Yeah, I agree with that. Just put it back to the pictures of the case. The white part is normal. There's no hypermelination or local encephalopathy for the LBSL DARS type. Surf one mutation probably. I, I don't think whether we can, we can take it any yeah, form. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there any um, subcortical white matter involvement? Not really, no. 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 So primary differential of a mitochondrial disorder and evaluate accordingly. Yes. Okay. All right. Next case is from Dr. Kavita. If Sahil, you are there, you can present the case. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, this child is four-month-old female, born of eighth issue of non-consanguineous marriage. 
uh, and uh, with normal perinatal history, but uh, develop history of developmental regression. And uh, also there is a his strong family history with the multiple abortions and uh, a sibling, a male child of seven month old who had uh, who has succumbed. He also had a global developmental delay with a history of regression, had uh, never had seizures, had uh, had a vision loss. Also his uh, VEP also showed prolonged latencies also. So the mother uh, came at two months of age that the child is not having a proper eye contact and social smile. And on 1st of February, the child had a tonic posturing of uh, all four limbs, uh, fever provoked, followed by which there was a rolling of eyeballs lasting for a minute. Um, on examination, there is no neurocutaneous markers. Head circumference is good, 3 to 50th centile. Passicity is there more in the upper limbs than in lower limbs. Reflexes were eligible. VEP, which was done, uh, it showed visual tract dysfunction. EEG was definitely abnormal and showed lots of delta activity on the right hemisphere. And uh, Vera was done, which was normal, and EMG and NCV we have done, so that is also normal. So uh, there is a strong positive history of reg regression with a strong family history. So probably we thought of some neurodegenerative disorder, uh, probably a white matter uh, disorder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there, here are the MR images at four months. Yeah, the four months on top of the diffusion weighted sequences. You have this confluent areas of restricted diffusion in the uh, superficial uh, white matter extending up to the subparticle regions. Coming more down, uh, you have the periventricular white matter as these uh, confluent areas of restricted diffusion. Central white matter is relatively spared. The deep brain nuclei also spared. Posterior fossa, uh, no signal changes on the DWS sequences. On the T2s and the flare images, T1 flare images, you can appreciate the confluent uh, white matter signal changes involving the bilateral cerebral hemispheres. The deep brain nuclei are relatively spared. Posterior fossa also in terms of signal and volume is uh, normal. Uh, the white matter changes on T2 demonstrate um, a reversal or some areas of refraction on the uh, flare images. No subcortical cysts, uh, no cortical malformations. The corpus callosum is probably okay for a four month child. Maybe some uh, hypo intensity along the inferior aspect aspect but other than that there is no abnormality so overall a diffuse white matter abnormality demonstrating restricted diffusion posterior fossa structure spared no subcortical uh, cysts based on the imaging pattern uh, one would think of uh, myelin vascularization or astrocytopathy related disorders i think clinically one can rule out there was the like, canavans they usually involve the gray matter phenylketonuria does the clinical presentation is not matching mitochondrials they can present with they can present with these changes but i'm not sure how it fits clinically i was thinking of a possibility of vanishing white matter based on the refractory changes on the flare images so you have the confluent white matter abnormalities on t2s which uh, so she has a suppression on the uh, flare images and these are early presentations or neonatal infantile presentations Again, white matter, diffuse white matter involvement with refraction on the flares. And restricted diffusion can be seen in the, uh, confluently in the conditions of associated with vanishing white matter, which is also seen in our case. Corpus callosum can be a two, but at this stage, the corpus callosum was not clearly identified. The middle portion is more commonly seen in the mitochondrial disorders, whereas the inner blade is more commonly involved in vanishing white matter. So leukodystrophy, astrocytopathy is a possible differential and uh, primary to look for vanishing white matter was my, um, are my thoughts on this case. That's quite comprehensive. Uh, there was also, a, uh, sorry. Yep. Yeah, uh, we yeah. were told that uh, there was also some cerebellar uh, changes, uh, white matter. Mm, no. I can't find anything, at least on the images. Okay, and when you have so much of diffusion restriction, how do you comment on the myelination? On diffusion, we don't comment on that, that on diffusion, I think. No, no, no. I mean, okay. because the T2 and all will uh, mostly look hyper intense only. Uh, yeah. Does it affect the T2 uh, appearance? And can we uh, comment on the myelination as well? Is your question, is it a myelin related disorder or is it a myelin vascularization or uh, astrocytopathy? Is that the question? 
No, no. What I'm trying to learn is when you have so much of diffusion restriction limited to the white matter, the white matter yeah. will look abnormal even on the T2, right? Yeah. Yes, it will absolutely. So, uh, how do we comment on the myelination part of it? So or it's uh, not possible. Yeah. We can't comment on the maturation of myelin and we can't really label this as hypomyelinating or dysmyelinating or anything. You're right. If you have spongiform swelling of the myelin, which is what Nihal actually was trying to mention, is it's myelin or toxic in a way, then yes, you cannot really use that at this point, at least in the active phase, to talk about how much myelin is being destroyed or it's hypomyelinating or whatever. I don't think you can be sure on that. Okay, thanks. And what about the uh, NA peak uh, being seen on the uh, MRS? Is it looking significant? Uh, the I didn't get the MRS pictures, Dr. Kavita. Do you have oh, an NA okay. peak, Kavita? Actually, it was just mildly elevated, what they said. So that's why we got confused. And uh, though the I mean picture is otherwise uh, fitting into that prenatal onset of uh, vanishing white matter. Yeah, so, I would have uh, thought so. And uh, okay. generally with that, we will see a lot of temporal involvement as well, isn't it? It's not spared here, but uh, it's quite a diffuse process. But I and think... Uh, Nihal, you... Thanks, thanks. And Nihal, you mentioned, Nihal you mentioned that PKU is odd, but uh, so I have had one of patient, my patients who at eight months had a similar MRI who had PKU. So, so no, I meant PKU... in terms of the clinical presentation. Clinical presentation, okay, but that's not yeah, odd. Yeah, yeah. PKU is no, not at the, yeah. not the imaging wise. I meant clinically. Yeah, because PKU yeah, is PKU this odd. imaging can be PKU. Yeah, yeah, because it's a treatable. We also seen. Yeah, this is a prenatal mm -hmm. onset with so many abortions and uh, as well as uh, you know one IUD was also there and then. So uh, I mean the clinical phenotype is not at all like PKU. Yeah, in I fact, think it what Dr. Edmund... PKU. It favors PKU. If you have so many abortions, mother care would have had a high, you know, phenyl ketone ketone levels, and that's why the abortion are happening. So that actually okay, mothers you are PKU. talking about. No, so that's why she had abortions, and when she had this baby, she had this MRI, and this MRI is seen in PKU babies. But the mother will be absolutely normal otherwise. Yeah, she can be normal. Just have abortions. Yes. Okay. She might not have intellectual sure. disability. Okay. Yes. She her, her levels okay. are just high enough to cause abortions. Okay. 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 It's just because it's just because it's a treatable disorder, and so mm -hmm. we should do a TMS. It will. It will. It is. It's not common, but we should still do it because this imaging can be seen with PK. Okay. Okay. Now we have already sent an exome. Let's see. <laughs> I will update you. Yeah. Okay. But that's a, a new new thing we learned. Thanks. Okay. Dr. Kavita, if you remember, you had a case of hypodermal cystinemia also, which has similar imaging findings. Uh, the clinical presentation was like this. Yeah. I'm not remembering. The one with the okay. dislocated. We have not done the homocysteine levels in this child. Yeah. Actually, that's no, a very good suggestion. Okay, I'll just go that's back and. Uh, that's a very good uh, suggestion, actually. Homocysteine. Yeah, I'll just also. check that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Okay, right, thank you. Case nine, Sahil. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, he is a 13 year old male child, born of first issue of third degree consanguineous marriage with normal perinatal and developmental history. So he had a transient ischemic attack on uh, uh, 20 December 2020. So that time he had com uh, com came with complaints of uh, headache right sided uh, followed by left sided weakness of both upper limb and lower limb. Previously also in 2016 he had a similar episode in leave of deviation of I2 left side and diplopia of left side which resolved gradually over a, few, a period of few hours. Uh, um, now, when he came, uh, uh, he had uh, his GCS was good, no neurocutaneous markers. He initially had a left choreoartetoid movements, uh, and then he had upper limb and lower limb uh, dystonia, which gradually improved, leaving a lower limb dystonia now and uh, circumduction gait now. 
uh, with a good power in all five by five by five power in all limbs. Uh, when he came recently to us, he again had an episode of right-sided headache, uh, followed by tingling and numbness only in the left upper limb. And so uh, we had uh, we were thinking of some uh, recurrent cause of uh, transient ischemia attack, like Moya Moya disease in this patient. We had yeah. So this case was actually presented in one of our previous meetings. So this is a, I think the child had multiple scans. This was scanned in, done in November yes. 21. And here you can appreciate that there is a right side MCA to infarct with probably MCA posterior watershed region, but predominantly the basal ganglia and the temporal and temporal parietal white matter, temporal region is involved. So our subacute ischemic stroke in the November scan. The so November 20. Yeah, November 20. Yes. Again, corresponding uh, hyperintensity. Uh, yeah, number 20. Okay. Okay. So in the T2 and FED, you can appreciate the change which was seen on the diffusion, but there were some areas of blooming on SWI. Uh, probably uh, some areas of hemorrhage or calcification. We don't have a CT. The MRA at that time uh, demonstrated this focal cerebral arteriopathy of the right middle cerebral artery. Just to correct me, was it December 21 or 20, Sahil? This is uh, December 21, latest scan with vessel wall okay. imaging. So December, okay, December 21, you can appreciate the abnormalities in the right basal ganglia. They have now formed cavitative changes with peripheral areas of is blooming on SWI, probably hemosiderin or dystrophic calcification. The, the vessel wall imaging at that point uh, demonstrated this occlusive or narrowed right middle cerebral artery. Post contrast, we could not find appreciate any vessel wall enhancement, but you can appreciate that the uh, right middle cerebral artery is hypoplastic. It's possibly some uh, collateralized formation, but I'm not pretty certain at, on these images. At that point, we probably uh, asked to rule out the possible causes of arteriopathies and infected related arteriopathies. The DSA was done when, Sahil? Sir, uh, in uh, February 2020. 2020. Okay. DSA so we have done now. Yeah. 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 So the on the right side, you can appreciate that the right middle cerebral artery is not visualized. Only the bud of the middle cerebral artery is seen. The left middle cerebral artery and the anterior circulation is uh, visible and normal. There are some, I think these are some areas of collateralization uh, in the right cerebral hemisphere. So chronically occlusive uh, right middle cerebral artery with formation of some degree of collaterals. The left circulation uh, demonstrates normal appearance. Anterior circulation also demonstrates normal appearance. So what the what was the question or not, uh, Dr. Avita Asai? If this fits into Moya Moya or not? Yeah, initially uh, at that time when we discussed, there was a doubt whether to call it Mayamaya or just a focal, uh, you know, cerebral narrowing, uh, focal arteriopathy. So yeah. now, uh, the are we more sure about Moya Moya thing or like what should be the uh, treatment? Because we showed to neurosurgeons for planning an EDAS in order to instead getting TIAs. Okay, but they are quite uh, uh, like confident that this is a uh, no collaterals are coming and then that's the reason that uh, it does may fail so i just wanted a neuroradiological as well as a neurological opinion dr mangal do you want to comment on that not particularly i think we have got enough uh, evidence for yeah. collateralization yeah. at this point isn't yeah. it yeah Just go back to the flare and see if you have any IV signs and any other clues. So the, only the DSA was done um, recently in Feb. There's no MRI. These scans are from the acute presentation 2020, exactly 2020. And yeah, I must say that the pattern of distribution of the infarcts is more of a focal cerebral arteriopathy, if you think yeah. about it. Yes. Um, but there is collateralization and in fact this picture just before this uh, sorry 
the MRA, I think you were showing. It shows quite a segmental stenosis, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think that's how it should be. And, and on follow-up, there's a rule of threes. Either the vascular flow will improve, stay the same, or get worse over time. But the pattern of infarct is more consistent with a focal cerebral arteriopathy or a primary CNS angiitis. Did you treat with steroids uh, by any chance? Yeah, so this child's, uh, uh, none of the inflammatory markers were positive. So we had not given steroids and we thought that it may be, you know, moya moya. Though that time we did not have good evidence of collaterals. And that's the reason why we went ahead with DSA. Uh, they're also like, they are not very sure whether we are getting good collaterals from ECA uh, for uh, uh, predicting a successful uh, EDAS surgery. So uh, we have not given him steroids and uh, uh, the child is left with a very severe uh, left lower limb dystonia and we are really worried with the ongoing TIAs whether he'll land up in a, another stroke. So the so, stenosis has or occlusion has remained just the same over the last two years. It has neither progressed uh, nor uh, you know improved. And on long-term neuroprotection, uh, would you commence them on something? Because at the moment, you're not picking up uh, new, de definite new infarcts in the brain either, unless you have repeated the scans, right? Are they collecting more yeah, infarcts no over new, time? New infarcts. No new infarcts, but the child is symptomatic. He's getting TIAs. So there is definitely some reversible uh, uh, ischemia going on. And surgeons are not sure whether they should go ahead with IDAS. And also, I just wanted to discuss this uh, case with the neurologists also in the panel, like how should we go ahead? I mean, at least uh, that's a useful information from you that there is a collateral formation. Yeah, but it's basal collateral. It's not coming from the external. Uh, if you ECA, want some okay. more help, Kavita, I'm happy to run this past our neurovascular meeting for you. It is going to be tricky to manage. If they were not having any TIAs, that would be easier for you. But you're not. It's a dynamic process still. It's not stabilized. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, that would be great. I'll send you the details. No issues. Yeah, yeah. send me something. Uh, be what, very useful. Nihal's presentation itself might do, but uh, a little more detail on what's exactly going on with TIAs. Sure, 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 sure. I'll send it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Case 10 is from Dr. Ramesh. If Surbhi is there, she wants to present it or Geeta? Okay, I'll go ahead. So it's a 10 year old girl with a global developmental delay, language more than motor, also presented with intellectual disability and some degree of patient dysmorphism. The development, um, there was independent walking at two years, scribbling and can eat by herself. Says 10 meaningful words. Understanding is better now. Toilet trained and partially dependent for daily activities. On examination, there are no pyramidal or extrapyramidal or cerebellar signs. She was born to a third degree consanguineous marriage with no prenatal issues. Clinically, they are suspecting a genetic disorder. So we have the MR images. On top are the T2 and the T1 weighted sequences, and you can appreciate that there is areas of malformed cortex. By in the bilateral frontoparietal regions, it's a polymicrogyric uh, type of cortex, predominantly in the frontal regions, also going up to the perisylvian regions. The parietal regions also demonstrate some degree of polymicrogyria, inferior temporal lobes on the left. Coming down to the cerebellum, you can appreciate there is multiple tiny subcortical and cortical cysts in the bilateral cerebellar hemispheres. The corpus callosum is slightly dysplastic, thickened in the anterior segments. Brainstem also is dysmorphic. And there's some degree of hypoplasia. The vermis is also abnormal. No calcification or hemorrhage on the SWS sequences. The, both the orbits demonstrate some degree of myopic or increased anterior posterior dimensions, probably mild cephalomatous changes. So overall cortical malformations, um, cerebellar cysts, abnormal corpus callosum and the brainstem with some degree of uh, dysplasia in the vermis. There was this focus of T2 hyperintensity in the anterior caudate nucleus, the caudate nucleus on the right side, which corresponds to T1 hypointensity, but I'm not sure of what the uh, lesion is. So, 
if we concentrate on the uh, cerebellar cysts and the malformation, uh, I think these are the possible differentials. Um, alpha dystrophic echinopathies, uh, GPR 36, though they have more of a co cobblestone type of malformation. Lama 1 usually does not have supratentorial uh, abnormalities or cortical malformations, even though they can be cerebellar cysts. So overall, these are the differentials which I think um, can be considered. Yeah. So those are my differentials. If anyone wants to add anything to it, that would be great. Are we able to narrow the differentials in any way with clinical clues here? Not really, right? No. Is that some signal change in the right codec nucleus? Yeah, there was a uh, signal change. It's focal T2 hyperintensity over here. Um, not sure what, what to make of that though. There is no acute ischemic uh, or stroke like event, no extrapedal, no pyramid or extrapedal signs too. So. And no hearing loss or impairment, right? No. And the eyes, how did you put that into the jigsaw? It can be abnormal in uh, uh, dystrophic echinopathies. It can also be seen in Lama on mutations. So those and are two possibilities. As well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at least we can narrow down to three entities to screen first, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Not sure about that caudate signal still, though. Hmm. There's no volume loss also. I mean, the control horn is pretty... Uh, there's no porencephaly or anything like that. So it's a glyotic change. Hematoma, I'm not sure. Yeah. Exactly. All right, okay. Okay. So going on to our last case is from Dr. Lokesh. Yes, sir. Nita is there? Yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, this yeah. child is a seven year old male child who presented with normal development, no uh, prior issues, who presented with a history of fever for four days. And on the day four of uh, fever, uh, they observed seizures and uh, rapidly progressing encephalopathy. And uh, also, like, uh, Encephalopathy was so severe, like it was improve, uh, rapidly progressing. He had he required the ventilatory support also for that. And on examination, he had a, a micropapillar rash involving the whole body, especially the palms and soles also. And uh, it was progressing to a petechial type of a rashes. And the, there was certain uh, pyramidal signs for presence here. So. These are the pictures on the palms and soles. On the day two of yeah. uh, his illness, MRI was done. Okay. So this is day two of illness. And uh, yes. though we have limited uh, images, diffusion, no restricted diffusion. So there is some degree of uh, motion, but probably the posterior sulcation pattern is not as clearly observed. Cannot appreciate any hyperintensities, but I think this was commented as a cerebral edema. Dr. Munkar, do you agree if these are changes yeah. of edematous changes? I, I think there is an encephalitic process going on here. Yeah. The, there, yeah. there is, it's, this is not at all distinct to the gray white interface. And in, in fact, you say there's no re restricted diffusion, but it might be reduced in some ways because there is some cortical okay. swelling. Uh, and you can see that the ventricles are also a bit squished. What was the age of this patient? Yeah. Seven years. Seven. Seven years. So you need a little more ventricle, and and the presentation was with some. What is your clinical so, difference here? Because this is an encephalitic. No, no, we have another. Yeah, we have another scan. And and was this a blanching rash, for instance? No, sir. So it was not a blanching rash. If it's not a blanching rash, then you're really worried about it, isn't it? Along with a rash and a brain that looks like that, it's going to be at least florid meningoencephalitis to work at.
Okay, so we had a follow up MR. With that, what age, what, what uh, time frame was the MR done? The second MR? About sixth day of illness, we had a follow up MR because of there was a deteriorating okay. sensorium. Uh, okay. And we were suspecting ANE, sir, actually. So. Okay. So Any the MR image. Is... Sorry, sorry. Any history uh, of pig bite? No, no ma'am, but uh, the fa father is a farmer by occupation and there is a lot of cattle around the house, ma'am. So the rash that you showed looked quite like we could see on our scrub typhus like It's looking like a vasculitic uh, papules. Ma'am. Okay, anyways, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just show the MR images. You're on the right track, Dr. Kavita. So, yeah. We'll probably discuss that after I show the images. So here we have multiple areas of restricted diffusion in the subcortical particle regions, bilateral cerebral hemispheres, predominantly in the posterior regions. The white matter also demonstrates the punctate foci of ischemic changes, corpus callosum also demonstrates these abnormal these are restricted diffusion changes. Some areas of restricted diffusion in the global paradigm on both sides. A small focus in the pawns. But overall, peripheral involvement, focal, multifocal involvement, and also white matter punctate lesions is probably fit into a uh, imaging pattern of vasculitis. T2 and flare, again, corresponding changes of uh, hyperintensities on the T2 and flare phase sequences. The corpus callosum has these multifo multifocal linear areas of involvement. No, no hemorrhage on the SWS sequences. No enhancement on the post contrast sequences. So, at that, this point of time, we're thinking of probable vasculitis clinically. Uh, rickettsia was raised. So, these are the representative images of the small vessel vasculitic pattern, which can be seen in rickettsia. They can also affect the cord equine nerve roots and demonstrate inflammatory changes. So, the rest of the clinical uh, presentation, I'll let Gita lead on. Yeah, Gita. So we had given him a steroids and also immunosuppressive therapy like that. So he showed the good improvements, sir. Uh, we we have given a dose of etoxilizumab for the benefit of doubt. And uh, there was good improvement over the next three days and only subtle spasticity was noted in the uh, lower limbs and the rash has improved, sir. And we have discharged him. Yeah, so carry on. So he, okay, so you have he given uh, doxycycline. Yeah, we have given doxy also, ma'am. So probably that might have worked, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so here, carry. like, yeah, so here we have a child with a fever, rash, and encephalopathy. So various differentials we were thinking at presentation was a mostly it is an infectious etiology because following a fever. So our differential diagnosis was a dengue, leptospirosis, and rickets shell mainly. So we have in investigated for that. And uh, there was subtle increase in the inflammatory markers, like uh, IL-6 was just 46. And uh, so our investigations wise, it came out as wheel felix was positive, but it was more of a, a favoring, uh, like a Rocky Mountain spotted fever and whereas, but the scrub typhus IgM was positive. So here we have two positive of the same group. Yes, sir. So, so whenever we see the child with this. Cross react. Yes. I think the antibodies, I mean, you may get a cross reactivity. That's why you may get it positive. But what is more common in India is supposed to be the scrub typhus. Yes, ma'am. It has more sensitive and specific. So we thought uh, yeah, it has a scrub Yes. So these were the various rickettsial agents. And whenever we see, like clinically, we see a rash with the palm and soul involvement. Uh, these are the various differential diagnosis. And uh, uh, rickettsia is one of them. So uh, these are the four uh, like criteria for the rickettsial infectious. And here the what was fitting clinically was a fever with rash and neurological complications. There were no other systemic features for this child. And epidemiologically, uh, child is, lives in an area with the cattle and uh, there are a lot of uh, farms around. And 
so all the differential diagnosis we could rule out and lab wise what were the positive was a leukocytosis thrombocytopenia and otherwise the other systemic things were normal other investigations but like inconclusive we have done even covid antibody also in initially it was also negative so like whenever we see this a uh, case of uh, any uh, like suspecting a recurrential case uh, we have uh, certain uh, handles with us and in that scenario we have to look for the certain suggestive lab features based on the lab features and the serology we can tell it as a probable or a confirmed case so here we had a good response with doxy uh, and wheel felix was positive with the titus 1 is to 640 and uh, igm scrub typhus was positive uh, and a total course of doxy was given for about 20, uh, 10 days as uh, it was uh, like a complicated thing involving encephalitis All right. Thank you, Geeta. If there are any further solutions. Just one uh, comment I wanted to make. Uh, the virologist uh, from NIV, like who worked extensively on this uh, condition, because that is what was causing that undiagnosed uh, encephalitis in Gorakhpur and all those areas. So initially it was thought to be viral encephalitis, but it turned out to be that, that they were most of them were cases of scrub typhus and actually what they say is that the mite is carried by the rodents into the house and these mites just bite and they're not like ticks you know that they will form an hr and all those things so scrub typhus should always be thought of and uh, we have added doxy as a uh, in a first line therapy only of all uh, you know encephalitis uh, like presentations so we add a septraxone uh, uh, vancomycin i mean for all meningoencephalitis uh, protocol includes doxycycline along with acyclovir and septraxone and vanco till we get all the reports uh, negative whatever is negative then is omitted so i think scrub typhus is definitely a treatable disorder that needs to be identified early nice case yeah uh, we Thank have you. one question uh, so there is a posterior cortical involvement is there whether uh, is it explainable by the only the rickettsial or no sorry the posterior cortical first of all i think the whole cortex was involved to start with on the first scan predominantly in the posterior the diffusion what restriction and what's the time difference in the two scans Yes, yeah, uh, four to five days. Okay. Four to five days. Because rickettsia can give you all forms of neurological involvement, right? Is that right, Kavita? Meningitis, all the way into the vasculitic yes. spectrum. So I think it starts with an encephalitic process, and then uh, in the right context. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we shouldn't call this press, for instance. There's so much restricted diffusion; it'll be atypical for that. Again, I think it's a great case to show this post-infectious phenomenon that rapidly evolves inside the brain. But I don't think the posterior distribution is taking us away from anything. And, and those little foci of restricted diffusion more centrally would be quite relevant as well. Did you have any visual impairment at this time with this posterior involvement? No, sir. He did not have any visual impairments. Yeah. It's a good mimic of press, isn't it, Nihal? Yeah. Did you yeah. mention the CSF positive. findings, Gita? CSF was like, uh, there was a raised proteins were there, ma'am, around 260, but cell count was normal, around two cells, and the sugars were also normal. And it what was, was the peripheral day. counts like? Peripheral counts were showing leukocytosis around 25,000 of WBC and thrombocytopenia around 1.6, ma'am. Yeah, because leukemoid reaction is another clue. They will have very high counts, more than 20,000 and all. So leukemia reaction can also, you know, give you a clue because most of the viral encephalitis will, in fact, have, you know, lower uh, um, spectrum of uh, WBC counts. That is another helpful uh, clue. But of course, you may get very high uh, TLC in back other bacterial meningitis also. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just had a question yeah. about the child. Uh, is, are his knees normal or is that just wasting around it? Pardon, sir? Are the knees, the knees sir. is that, why is it so prominent medially on both sides? He had like uh, almost for five days he was on bed. He had mild spasticity initially, sir, but it was improving. 
and he was able to walk and uh, presently he is able to walk without support sir okay maybe so not, not about the gait i think the question was are the knees prominent are the Is he looks, still built. Yeah, yeah. Probably is malnourished as well. Maybe vitamin D deficiency yeah. and other things. I think so. Yeah. Wait. Wait. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. That was our last case. Um, so thank you once again for all your comments, Dr. Mankar, Dr. Avita, Dr. Vivek. Thank you. Thank you very much. Meet. Great learning. Thanks. No, Neha, we'll meet you again on 11th March. What you're doing is phenomenal. Okay. Right. Thank you. And hope all the neurologists have a good AOCN uh, over in Ahmedabad over the weekend. So we'll see you in March again.